Good afternoon, everybody. It's Steve with Real Progressives. Today, I'm going to be interviewing a friend and fellow Real Progressive, gentleman named Guy Mamoun. Guy is going back a ways. Guy and I met online years ago um, doing uh, discussions about progressive causes. Uh, he was a Green Party candidate. He had previously run as a Green as well. And, and Guy and I spoke at length about economics. Over the course of time, Guy and I have developed a friendship. Um, and so what I wanted to do was allow Guy to come on here. I talk a little bit about his journey, talk a little bit about his candidacy, and talk a little bit about how he came to understand what he understands about the economy and how that pertains to changing the world. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is bring on my friend, uh, Guy Mamoun. Welcome to the show, Guy. How are you today, sir? Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And thank Real Progressives for giving me this opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. So why don't why don't we do this? You're running for Maryland's second district for Congress. And, um, you know, I was around when you made that decision. And I remember you sending me your, uh, the, you know, what you thought your uh, platform would look like, etc. And you really wanted to do this. You were very nervous, but you you believed in what you were doing. Here you are now. You've I've watched your videos in front of League of Women Voters. I've watched other things you've done. You've really come around, man. I'm, I'm really, really impressed. Talk to us about why it is that you decided to run for Congress. Well, you know, as as you know, uh, in our in our various discussions, I, I ran in 2010 and in 2012. And the impetus of me running in 2010 was simply due to the fact that the hope and change we were promised never came, or it came in marginal pieces, you know, but my expectations were were a bit more than someone who I felt was over-promising and under-delivering. So after George Bush, we had this blue wave come, and in the aftermath, there was, there was not much fruit to bear, so to speak, you know, and in fact, post-2008, post, uh, post uh, 2008, 2009, you know, our wars across the world expanded from two countries to seven, you know, instead of getting universal health care, patients became uh, consumers. You know, uh, habeas corpus, unfortunately, was suspended through the uh, Section 1021 of the NDAA. So our civil liberties eroded. Uh, quality of life is pretty much, you know, stagnant in terms of wages. There wasn't the delivery that we were all promised never came. So I had this moment of political catharsis. And I unfortunately I had to to uh, throw the, Democrat, the Democratic Party out the window. Now, at a debate in 2010, when asked who my inspiration was to run for office, I, I cited Bernie Sanders. And I mentioned this on, on another show where, you know, I was at the debate and, and I literally drew, this is a funny story, actually. I literally drew a, a blank when asked the question. The, the question was asked, so who is your, your inspiration for running for office? And I looked at the person next to me and I literally took my, my hand and like slapped his lapel. And that person was Warren Mosler. And I said, dude, dude, what's the name of that guy running for independent in, in Vermont? And he looked over. He's like, Bernie Sanders? I'm like, yes, yes, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> so I said, Bernie Sanders. And Warren looked at me like, what the hell? You know, but it was, it was a moment we shared. Now, mind you, at the time, I had no idea, a lick, you know, a lick from Adam, what MMT was. And, and Warren, God bless him, was doing his best to educate and help people understand the whole concept behind modern monetary theory and why, you know, uh, spending on the de deficit spending on the public purpose is the way to go to stop the artificial disparity, to stop the, the economic catastrophe and salvage the middle class from further descending into the transitioning into the working poor. But he's almost too smart for his own good. And that's a compliment in a way, because it took people like yourself, it's actually you, who kind of, and I hate to use the word dumb down, but you, you kind of did. You, you dumbed down MMT for a lot of us. And then I, I kind of pieced together what the hell he was saying. And then, I, and then I'm like, oh, I had this, I, had, I went from having a political cathar moment of catharsis to an economic moment of catharsis. And when I separated the gold standard and did away with, you know, taxes, you know, fund spending myth, that's when the light came on. And, and I felt this, I had this moment of, embarrassment mixed with anger and and i can only describe it as rage real unadulterated no holds back kind of rage in thinking that there's this grand myth going on that's dividing people of all classes and even race i mean everything is rooted into economics when you when you think about it i mean you've said this many times and i agree with you that 
taxes don't fund spending, and we can all have nice things. The, the, the political will simply does not exist at the hands of people who have mismanaged our government for the past four decades, to the point where people are scrambling, they're losing their minds, they're committing suicide, they're, they're living hand to mouth, they're homeless. You know, 50% of the American population is on or below the poverty line. You know, it's a mess. It's, it's, it's not a mess. It's a catastrophe. It's this silent catastrophe going on where there's this campaign of economics being weaponized as a tool of attrition. And I'm one of the good guys that wants to go in there and stop that. But to answer the question, you know, back in 2010, I ran. Back in 2012, I ran. I was the founder of the Green Party of the United States Virgin Islands. I ran other candidates to office. We all did our best. But I, I realized that much like in the Virgin Islands, you have this culture of corruption. It was the microcosm of what goes on in the state. So I got to look from the outside in really at the, at the, at the, at the evil that was going on, not just locally, but nationally as well. And when I met you, the conversation between me and you was, was more in line of getting you to run than me to run. <laughs> but, you know, someone has to do it, and you impressed upon me that I could. And, you know, I, maybe it wasn't the smartest decision to, to, to run this time because I literally reluctantly decided to run at the 11th hour, which is four, four months to the election. I, I threw my head in thinking, you know what, they, they need a body, you know, but they also need a fighter. You know, and, and I like to think I'm both a body and a fighter, you know, but, um, you know, it was it was your words that that resonated in me. You know, you said to me, Guy, you got you got a kid. You got a kid. Not only do you have a kid, you have a kid on on, on that has a disability. You know, what are his chances going to be like if we don't have people like you fighting the good fight, standing up? You know, and and I said, you know, I said, you're right. I want to be able to look my kid in the eye years from now, hopefully decades from now. Hopefully things will have changed, but if they don't, if we stay the course and the earth is on fire, I'm going to look like I'm going to kneel on. The, well, I'm not going to kneel. He'll be older, but I'll look at him in the eye and said, "Hey, you know, I, I did my best to avoid climate disaster. I did my best to avoid artificial disparity. I did my best so that we can have equality for everyone. That we can have, you know, all the things that we're clamoring for: universal health care, federally funded education, maternity leave, paternity leave." Form a livable wage, and not just at fifteen dollars an hour. I mean, that's like the catchphrase of the day. It should be more in line of like twenty-five dollars, even thirty dollars an hour. You know, adjusted for the cost of living and inflation. I mean, there's there's just so much to say, and I don't know how I don't know what we're going to cover in the time that we have. But my heart is in it. You know, I I I I want to serve. I think the greatest act one can do, honestly, is to serve and to ensure that future generations are not left in the hands of sociopaths. Because that's what we have right now. We have, you know, look, there's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with being successful and being driven to succeed. But if what you do is toxic to the environment, if it's toxic to, to humanity, if it, if it, you know, operates as a, as a means of, you know, uh, disrupting our genome, you know, disrupting our endocrine system, you know, disrupting our central nervous system, our health, public health, then you got to stop. We have to stop. Big oil, you got to die. Big agriculture, you got to die. We got to find some, some other way to, to harness energy, renewable ideally, that Green New Deal that we have to pay for with MMT, you know, we have to find a better way of growing food, you know, um, growing food. I think growing food, that's, that's pretty but, huge instead of go ahead. Sorry. sorry. No, 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 no. It's OK, because uh, what I want to do is I want to be able to give you a time boxed little windows here because you, you, your whole platform is who you are. It's really that really is the beautiful thing. It's like you can tell when people are parroting something that they got from somewhere else and you can tell when somebody owns something there. It's who they are. Now, you know, this is a conversation between two yeah. friends. You just happen to be running for office. Okay. So w when I think about this, w what I think is most incredible here, okay, you did try to push me to run for office repeatedly. And I would just ignore your text because it's like, I can't do it, dude. I can't do it. And I had... I had the Green Party of Pennsylvania folks pushing for me. I had all of our friends pushing for me to run. I couldn't do it. I because still if there was anyone better to, to bitch slap, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Section M? Bob, Howard. No, Howard. Howard. No, Howard. 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 Yes. Is there anyone who could, who could get the job done? Maybe you. <laughs> yes. I, I, I have, would have great glee in doing that too. Trust me. <laughs> but, 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 but just on a very serious note, though, as far as it goes, um, you know, I was presented with a position that I couldn't do, and it was 
just soul crushing. I actually went to my work and said, hey, guys, would you mind if I ran for Senate, you know, when the Green Party ticket in the state of Pennsylvania? And they said, you're free to do it, but you probably won't have a job. And literally from that point forward, you could see the spiral of my tenure vanishing out the window. So, um, you know, there's some things that just are better left unsaid and left undone. And I'm going to leave it at that because this is all about you right now. And for me, the, the way I've looked at this is this. You came at this as a true Green Party person. You originally, way, way back when we first met, you were, I don't want to say you are just a Green Party person, but you were just a Green, right? You you didn't have this broader knowledge. Then all of a sudden, you started mixing with the MMT crowd. You you had to fight through it. You You had to knock the whatever the things that lies, the myths that you have been told in years. Then you had to embrace the fact that you had sat there with Mosler and you would go, oh, my God, what did I do here? After the fact. I After like, the fact, the big mea culpa. And, and, but but this, this, see, for me, this enlightenment is really powerful. This is the part that tells people, hey, I, I ha- not only have a vision for how to deliver, but I also know how to pay for the damn thing. So anything right. I say is end-to-end foolproof. So, uh, to me, that is the winning progressive strategy. I just don't see too many of Talk to me about how that light bulb moment happened for you and a little bit about what that does to the platform. You talked about your son. You talked about health care, talked about these things. But there is a component for as long as I've been alive, Congress critters like yourself, people running for office have come out here and tried to sell me a bill of goods that they're going to raise taxes to pay for things. And absolutely nothing gets done. But the country keeps going further and further to the right. So here right. you are saying, hey, dude, I've got this thing. Talk to me about this thing. Tell me about how when you say when you say this thing, it's it goes back to that that term I used um, economic catharsis. So how did how did I get my moment of economic catharsis? You know, Warren was talking about deficit spending and, and a payroll tax holiday to to help out with the minimum wage. And all these all these terms were like boggling my mind. I saw him at the as the enemy, as the enemy number one. You know, I saw him as a one percenter, which. That's that's not fully true. I mean, he is a businessman and a successful businessman, but he's also an educator and an and an MMT. So I put those things first. So when he started discussing these things and about fiat currency, I mean, I, I had no idea we were off the gold standard. I, like many other people, millions upon millions of people, thought we were still stuck to a particular commodity standard that that tied to our currency, and that the value of money, the more we printed, the more the the value of it devalued. Well, that's not the case with a term called fiat currency. So when I researched fiat currency, you know, I just, it just, it just kind of this free floating currency idea just swam in my head. And, and I started putting the pieces together. And then I realized there's nothing holding Congress back from spending on the public purpose. We can have, as you say, all nice things. And this campaign of murder by proxy could come to a screeching halt right now. But what I see what I do, Steve, uh, what I do see, Steve, is that you have political aspirants that are that are running as progressives in this election, and God bless them, we need them. But not many of them, although educated on MMT, are willing to profess this message because they say, "Well, I don't want to be an economics professor. I don't want my my campaign to be an educational campaign, singularly, because a lot of people are not going to get it." And I'm like, well, this is your opportunity, front and center, to, to bring the subject to light. This is the linchpin that unifies all of us, regardless of partisanship. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Green or a Libertarian or maybe a Libertarian. But it doesn't matter, you know, what you are, <laughs> what, who you align yourself with. You know, if, if your goal is to, is to serve your, your constituency, that's how it's going to get done. You know, that's how you're going to find out what their needs are at the local and state level and at the federal level, review those needs and provide so that those needs can be fulfilled through through deficit spending. OK, well, let, let me ask you, I want to ask you a, a bigger question here. Right. So okay. you're running as a Green Party candidate and Green Party puts itself out there as a decentralized party, blah, blah, blah. But the Green Party has Section M of its national platform, which sounds remarkably like the Republican platform that we got to reduce the debt and the national debt's going to kill us. And, and also, how, how does a Green Party candidate break from the national platform so that they can run on economic truth? I mean, wh- 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 how does that 
Well, you know, you, you don't have just myself. You have Rodolfo Cortez. I think he's running in District 40 of California, you know, um, and I, I'd like to think Kenneth May, Maja, but I'm not too sure if he has embraced NMT in his platform. Um, but I know Rodolfo and I have. So to answer the question, how do we how do we break away from the the party line just by being objective and being individuals and, and staying true to ourselves? You know, I, I can't be pigeonholed or typecasted because, you know, the, the Green Party at the national level chooses to adopt an economic platform that I wholeheartedly disagree with. I mean, it just makes no sense to me, you know. But then again, you know, when, when, when you said when you first met me, I was a diehard Green, I guess I was more of a diehard environmentalist slash technocrat more than, you know, your, your typified uh, tree-hugging, pot-smoking, hippie <laughs> green, which is cool, too. We have plenty of them, and they're awesome, you know, but you also have, you, know, you also have the more, the more um, how do I say it? There are different shades of green across the entire spectrum, is That's what I'm trying to say. That's a very, very good way of saying it. I was waiting for that. That was a perfect line right <laughs> um, All right. I, I've been... I mean, yeah, and there's no shoe one. There's no one shoe fits all political party. So I, I had friends of mine saying you need to run as a Dem, and I'm like, listen, you know, I took my inspiration from Bernie Sanders before the term Bernie Crat existed. You know, the guy was an independent senator for 30 years, and he ran, you know, a, pro a progressive uh, agenda throughout the entire time. Uh, he did things that that I I don't like. Uh, like he would not vote for for war, but he would vote for spending on the war. So I found there there to be somewhat of a Dichotomy, and I don't want to piss off Bernie supporters. Like I said, I was I, I cited him as my inspiration before the term Bernie Crad existed. He was my go-to guy for for saying, "Hey, if he could do it as an independent, why can I do it as a green or an independent or just not affiliated with the duopoly, with the two bought and owned public relations front of a political party system that we have in this country, where the 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 the, the windfall is always is always catered to the one percent." I didn't want to be part of that. I didn't want to be part of uh, of a party that rigs its own primary. I didn't want to be a part of a party that overpromises and underdelivers consistently. I just thought, no, if, if, if branding is an issue, if people, if people are so concerned and so tribal in their thinking about, oh, I have to vote a certain way because my family votes this way or I base my identity on, on my politics, then I needed to change my identity as a Green and embrace MMT and talk about other pragmatic ideas that I want the Greens to embrace. I'm trying to, I guess I've Green entered to try to make the Greens go a bit more left, <laughs> you know? And this is not a critique of the Greens. I'm trying to help the Greens in my own unique way, is that- Everybody's learning, man. Everybody. Everyone's learning. Everyone's yeah. learning. I mean, I, I still support them. I support maybe seven-eighths of what they're all about. The one-eighth, when it comes to economics, I don't. And that's why I'm here. Right. So, okay. So let, let, you, you, you brought up your son and obviously this is another bond you and I have with, with children on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, being, being a parent in the United States is, is a tough job to begin with. Being a parent with a child with special needs is absurd and having to work is preposterous. You are someone that's intimately aware of the, the needs of care, the time, um, all the effort that goes into that and the costs. What would you as, as Gima Moon congressional candidate do um, to facilitate a, a more, you know, more care, more awakening, more, more, whatever, more services, more, more thought, more, you know, support for, for families in general that have children that fall in the spectrum. I'm going to answer that question on, on a multiple of fronts. I first want to point out that as, as, as much as people can sympathize with the predicament of another person, if they're not living it, then they can't understand it. And I think society is so fractured and disconnected, despite the fact that we have computers and work has been condensed, the work of 10 people into one. You know, we're working so hard. You know, we're, we're trying to just keep up every day, keep a roof over our head. We don't have time to really network with our communities and, and really branch out beyond our, our smaller circles. You know, because if you go out farther enough, you'll find that there's an endemic going on with kids having disabilities in this country. You know, and it has to do with our air, our water, our food quality, pesticides, pollution. You know, so if, you, if people were, were more aware of the plight of, of others in their community, they would have a more firmer understanding of what it is we go through. And it's not easy. Having a child that is, that is on the spectrum, you really, really learn 
I've learned actually. I um, there was this one time where him and I were in Central Park, the Central Park Zoo, and he wanted to go see the penguins. Right? He loved the penguins. How they would like jump on the rocks and then you know jump in the water and splash around and swim around. It was all it was all fun and good. So we'd go to the exhibit, we'd spend some time there, and then we'd leave. And then we'd walk around the sea lion uh, exhibition and make our way toward the reptile section. Now, instead of going into the reptile section, he said, Daddy, Daddy, I want to go back into the, rep into the uh, penguin section again. I was like, oh, okay, sure, let's, we're here, let's go back. So we'd make our way, and instead of staying, he would just loop out of it and, and, and keep walking. And then I'd follow him, like, where, where are you going? Like, let's, let's watch what's going on. Let's watch, you, you wanted to be here. He's, and he wouldn't answer me. Next thing you know, I'd follow him to the entrance of the reptile section again, and he'd say the same thing. I want to go back to the penguin exhibition. And he would, and I'd follow him. And after the fourth time, I had to put my foot down to be like, dude, we're not, we're not doing this. We have to keep, you know, we're here to talk and spend time with one another and look at the other exhibits. And he insisted. He was having, he was having his first major tantrum, his mm. first uncontrollable major on-the-spectrum autism tantrum. And despite my 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 um, desire to to verbally negotiate things, there was no negotiating. He was full blown going someplace where I couldn't follow. Now, when I was a kid and I threw a tantrum, my dad uh, he basically put me on his knee and spanked the shit out of me. I mean, he hit me so hard I saw I saw the living daylights, but I didn't cry. I I was just brought to attention. I just you know it just stopped. I was in shock and awe. And from, from, that, from that moment on, I never threw a tantrum. But you can't do that to a kid on the spectrum. So I had to wait. I had to wait 45 minutes. And everybody around me, every parent, every kid was staring at me. And I felt embarrassed. And I felt ashamed. But then, you know what I thought to myself? This isn't their fucking problem. And they don't care. This is my problem. And that's when I had this instant moment of unconditional love and I just took it. I dude, I can so relate to that. I mean, obviously I want to give you a chance to catch your breath because I fully understand. I took it. I took it and I had this this wave of unconditional love over me. And it didn't matter what anyone thought. It didn't matter what people were were what they were staring at me. I just didn't care. I just cared about him and about him you know, getting it out of his system. And in years, in years since, we've, we've managed to contain the tantrums. I've managed to, through unconditional love, get at his level, at his eye level, and talk him through what he's going through without him having to, to lose his shit. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So what would I do? Um, <laughs> what wouldn't I do? You know, when it all, look, so long as we have the resources, as you've said many times, and the human, the human resources and the natural resources to combat any problem, miracles can happen. Absolute miracles can happen. But if we have funding available for, for AIDS, for teachers, for therapists, you know, if we lift the cap on disability and allow these people, regardless whether you have autism or you're a vet, a disabled veteran, or you know, you're, you're someone who, who just had a misfortune, wrong place at the wrong time, car accident, and, and you've been permanently damaged, you should not have to stress out for the rest of your life how you're gonna survive and potentially end up on the streets. Again, economics weaponized as a tool of attrition. It's the most poor, the most vulnerable people that our government is, our government. Our government isn't bad. It's the people mismanaging our government that are bad. They're downright evil. They're downright evil. So whether it's pensioners, whether it's disabled, we have to lift the cap, the funding cap on, 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 this, on these block of people. It's wrong. It's just wrong. So it's wrong. In your area, in District 2, what are some of the most important things going on in your area in general? What, what, describe District 2 to us. District 2 is a very conservative, conservative area. My understanding is that the population, 80% are people of color, okay? I would think that the people in my district would want uh, a federal job guarantee, you know, because part of it does include Baltimore and, and the surrounding counties and unemployment. We're not, <laughs> there's no such thing as full employment in this country. So bringing, bringing jobs to, to the second district 
and by extension at the federal level, passing legislation that would ratify a federal job guarantee would be a, a boon to the economy and to people of, uh, that are unemployed, to the unemployed. Um, sacrifice cities, sacrifice zones, rather. We have, we have several, dis- several uh, counties uh, in Baltimore County, Montgomery County, and um, West Baltimore that are sacrifice zones. The quality of their water is, uh, contains high levels of lead and other toxins. Okay, so I think having clean water would be a priority to these people. You know, the air in Baltimore is rated one of the worst. I think it's in the top 10 worst in the country. You know, so there are a lot of basic in education. We have schools that are closing. We have, we have blight. We have swaths of, of, of real estate that is just abandoned. I mean, we could, we could have a housing program, you know, like a dollar, a dollar buyback, housing program to get people housed. We have a homeless population here that is, that is out of control. You can't go to downtown Baltimore and not see homeless people. And although people say, oh, it's the same characters, how do they know? These characters, they, they, they shuffle around, they, they get recycled, they get moved, they get shuffled. Homelessness in this country is a problem. So I think, in, you know, systemically, that which plagues any city, whether it's Baltimore or New York or Flint, Michigan, or, or um, Big Tuna, Texas, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. You know, quality of life, clean access to clean air, clean water, clean food, education, transportation, Jesus. You know, just, you know, if you're going to do something, do it right. If you're going to be in politics, if you're going to be a statesman and you're going to, to you know, uh, engage in civil planning, you know, do it right. Do it right so that everyone's needs are met, you know, and not just your donors. Right you know on. I, mean? I do. So, absolutely. So l- l- let me ask you this question because I, I come from Maryland and um, Maryland's a strange, strange, uh, <laughs> is a strange uh, state to say the least. But when, when it comes, this is, this is, this is snuff. This is snuff. He was, uh, his name is snuff because he was almost put down. By his original owner, the poor guy had a blockage in his urethra, and he was uh, his 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 pet parents couldn't afford to take care of him, so I opted to take care of him, and I changed his name to Snuff because he almost had his lights snuffed out. No kidding. Well, oh, yeah, he's, he's my best buddy. Very, up, very good. So he's running for office with you then? <laughs> oh yeah, no, he's he's uh. He's my good conscience, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, so one one final thing, I want to I want to try and put this into perspective. You know, sure. the, the elections coming up here in a few days. Um, I've I, you've gone through the steps of trying to ensure that people know what your platform is. You put together a have web- I? Have I I think you have. I think you've taken I've, a good shot at it. I mean, <laughs> I've had I've had little to no to no support. I reached out to the DSA in Baltimore, who, who told me when I first walked into the room, we are not going to be endorsing you. And I didn't even say anything. <laughs> I, just, I didn't even say anything. But I got to chit, chit chat with them for a good two and a half hours. And it was enlightening, somewhat humbling, and a little bit humiliating. I left feeling very dejected. And I know they're doing phenomenal work. And I plan on working with them and hope that the electoral committee of my particular DSA may change their, their delivery and their approach. Um, but what, you know, before we go, before we wrap up, I do want to say this, that there are corporate Dems running in this race as there are progressive Dems running in this race. What I don't like, what I, or where rather what I would like to see is the progressive variety of Democrat cross-endorsing those of us who are green running against corporate Democrats. Because the only way, the only way you know, working within the confines of this system if there's going to be any kind of radicalized reform that's going to benefit the 99% is if we get there together. Anyone who's a corporatist, you got to kick to the curb. You have to embrace some of us who, who are green, who, who couldn't bring ourselves ethically, 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 ethically. <laughs> yes, you got it. Sorry, I, I get tongue tied. Who couldn't bring ourselves ethically to represent the democratic party i was asked i was told you should run as a dem and i said nope maybe i'm I'm wrong to sticking to my guns you know i I was a dem i was a hardcore dem i would have taken you know a bullet for obama back in the day you know and the same fervor i see people having for for bernie i i had for obama back in the day and as a green i i was kind of on the fence with bernie i was like i want to see what he what he's going to do and then in you know in philly philly just kind of like was was the done deal when he didn't walk out and and 
But then again, this kind of talk causes division between Berniecrats and and Democrats, and 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 then you got your trolls who victimize the screens who try to have a discussion, an open discussion about this kind of stuff. And I just I just couldn't do it. I just can't. Knowing what I know now, I just I can't. I just can't. So. All right. So, Guy, let, let's go ahead and close this out because I want to give you a chance to make your pitch. Um, My pitch? Yeah. I mean, you go ahead. I mean, you've been doing it the whole time, and I think everybody's really been enjoying this. So, you know, obviously, we we as real progressives can't endorse candidates, but we can certainly give information to viewers and stuff to make their own choice, you know, own decisions. So, go right. ahead. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, what you would do. Uh, should you uh, get in the office and why someone might want to vote for you? Okay. I, I, I'm not going to, to, you know, reinvent the wheel in, in, in pitching the whole progressive spiel, whatever you heard before. And again and again, I'm all about it, but here's something you haven't heard. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves. This is going to be a big shocker. Congress is in session typically half a year. Okay. That leaves a big chunk of ch a big chunk of time where these guys pretty much are, you know, not doing their job. All right, to ensure a pro the passage of a progressive agenda, any bills that are introduced to Congress that are being tabled and potentially are going to die while Congress isn't in session, what I would do as a member of Congress, I would go from town to town, district by district. And I would do my best to enlighten the constituents of other districts, why they were, who the representatives are, not who they are, but, you know, what they're doing, their activity, why they're against, you know, Medicare for all, for example, or public, you know, fully, fully federally funded public education. I would do my best to get these guys out of office. I would expose them. I would sabotage their political careers. We're talking about guys who have been there like, you know, five, you know, five cycles, 10 cycles, 12 cycles, whatever, 20 years in office. Guys that have no, no, no uh, drive whatsoever at fulfilling and serving the public purpose. I would make it my business when we're not in session, right? We're still being paid to just expose these guys. Go on the radio, go on talk shows, go in the media, do town halls and try to inject progressive ideas into the conversation and maybe help other candidates, I suppose, that are fully embracing progressivism. So I would, I would try to, from the outside, I guess, you know, remake, refit Congress in my own, in my own unique way. Because you figure half the year, what are we going to do? Sit around? No. I'm not going to wait for another election cycle to come around, to come about, to, to then, then change the conversation or have this conversation. It would be throughout the entire year, throughout the entire time I'm in Congress. When I'm not on the floor, I'm talking to the people. When I'm not drafting a bill or co-sponsoring a bill, I am you know, frontline and center talking to people, regardless of what district they're in, just to make sure that we get the service we need from our government. So I guess, I guess that's it. I, I implore you to vote for me. I'm up against a career politician, the, the equivalent of Joe Crowley, I suppose, in Maryland. He's, he's pro-surveillance state. He's pro-war. He's not pro-health care, at least not universal health care. He wants to refit the Affordable Care Act. I mean, there's a laundry list. If you go to my website, guyforcongress.us, You'll see a section like critical analysis of Dutch Rupert's Burger. You'll see the, the one debate that I was in that I was allowed to be in. Uh, and thank you to the League of Women's Voters. And, and that's about it. And just, you know, vote with your conscience. Try not to say tribal in your mind of, 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 of your allegiance to any particular party. That's it. All right, brother. That was great. Thank you so much, Guy. I really think you knocked it out of the park. I hope. I don't know. Hey, it was the best. It's a cake, wasn't it? It's a cake. Hey! Hey, it's hey, there. <laughs> no, I, I, I applaud you. And, and, you know, I know that this is not easy for you because I remember our first time really meeting in Washington, D.C. And if, you know what? I, I should have probably started off with this, but I'm going to finish this off with this. OK, so I get invited to speak at a rally in Washington, D.C., and I'm really excited about it turns out to be a Trump Q rally. I had no idea what I was in for at all. So I show up there with my real progressive colors on. 
I'm, I'm sitting there ready to talk, and all of a sudden, I got these MAGA hats sitting there yelling at me, you, you, you're progressive, you have free comedy and all that stuff. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to speak in front of this crowd. What do I do? And there's Guy there. And he's the only guy there coming to support Steve Grumby. There's Guy. My, but by the time it was all over, this is the interesting thing, and this is what makes your economic platform and MMT in general so powerful. I was able to shift gears on the fly and be able to address veterans affairs, autism, and, and, and really, quite frankly, um, keep, you know, the, the things that mattered to them. And by the time it was all said and done, I was blown away to hear a MAGA crowd applaud me, literally do this number and say, this guy knows what he's talking about. I was just like, wow, I did not anticipate that. So when you talk true economics and don't, partisanize it if you will you just talk what right. is real you can bring huge groups of people together and i i think that that right there my friend is going to be a powerful uh tool for you uh in this election and in the future should you you know should you run again etc so my yes, friend I, 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 I took a six-year six hiatus between 2012 and 2016 and 2018 sorry, sorry. Six six year hiatus. Hiatus. i didn't think i'd be doing this i really did it because of you well, thank you, brother. We, we hope I hope you I hope you win. Um, I didn't say that as real progress. I said that as your friend. <laughs> anyway, in other words, have a great time. Good luck. And we'll talk to you. We'll catch up with you after the election. So long, everybody. All right, brother. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>